I'm Christopher Mont, former academic and former State Department uh, lanyard ghoul. I uh, <laughs> I have um, I want to one day publish a book on Native American geopolitics and how the kind of apocalyptic events of disease die off and land theft created a unique indigenous style of reacting to crisis. Well, the project was to figure out what, if any, I mean, it was always open-ended as to if I would be successful, but if any, uh, was, like, was there a concept of a Native American understanding of geopolitics that was not just specific to one particular tribe and would be north of like the Rio Grande going out of the Spanish Empire going out of the densely populated Mesoamerican area. So uh, looking at, you know, uh, the plains, the eastern woodlands, the west coast, etc. Um, this is still related to what I'm doing, but it's changed to be more about apocalypse culture or effectively how these various tribes, whether similarly or in different from each other, adapt to the one-two punch of massive epidemics of disease that really cut their numbers and subsequent societal breakdown with the arrival of very alien colonists from very far away. Uh, so it's become more of a kind of historical equivalent of like when things get really, really rough, how do small groups of people adapt both kind of ecologically and um, in terms of their concept of land use, uh, politics, diplomacy, warfare, etc. It's important to restore the voice of indigenous actors when we talk about things like political theory and geopolitics, which normally is assumed to only be A, modern, and B, kind of for intensely bureaucratic states. Um, you know, East Asia, Middle East, and Europe, effectively, are, are what are considered to be states that have theories of government. Um, and having intensely studied many of those states, I can say that, yeah, sure, they wrote more stuff down <laughs> themselves, but um, they're definitely not alone in having a geostrategic worldview, um, which is why I've kind of moved in the direction of restoring people who are often considered to be barbarians or outsiders to relevance in the study of geopolitics and, and strategy and that type of thing. Uh, so yeah, yeah, it's effectively, you know, putting indigenous people back in the pilot seat of these issues um, when usually they're either seen as just hapless victims of them or kind of just like completely outside of it entirely. I came here uh, to look through as many sources as I could. I had to officially list what I was here for so I said the Six Nation papers because I knew I would look at them and I already have experience doing research on the uh, Iroquois Confederacy, so I just kind of went with that. And that was the first thing I looked at, and that didn't really change my direction, but once I started going through the Creek Papers, uh, the Choctaw Papers, the Sioux Papers, uh, lots of other papers that have very specific names that aren't necessarily tribes, um, just looking for anything that was relevant, I came across more and more of the, the theme of like rapid adaptation, uh, trying to deal with um, you know, very a shocking situation, um, how to make sense of it. Um, these things just kept coming up, even though they weren't my original uh, research topic, and so I kind of prioritized them over my original topics as I went along, just based off the source material I was finding. And I was like blown away by the things I found that weren't necessarily directly related to my research, like I found some very cool uh, land grant deeds and some interesting kind of like artwork and stuff like that but when it comes to what I specifically came here for uh, I mean it was it was new and different enough that it changed my research topic and noticeably if not entirely but I wouldn't say like anything was like oh wow that like up up is an upheaval for my entire world or anything it was it was much more just a combination of confirmation of certain things I suspected as well as the whole like, oh, your priorities need to change. Um, and um, But that's good because it's, it's always better to work with primary sources. Uh, it, it's not that primary sources are necessarily more reliable in a sense because they are, after all, uh, usually written by one person in each document and uh, I, mean, I work a lot with army documents and that's really just showing one side of uh, things but it really does allow you to infer things. Also when you go for big um, secondary source material, not that there's anything wrong with that, but you, you're getting kind of a selected choice, uh, a cultivated selection by whoever the author is, whereas if you deal uh, with primary sources a lot you're gonna get 
everything, including what other researchers did not include for a variety of reasons. So you might find out something that you otherwise did not know. Um, I mean, I use a combination of both because I'm always working kind of with political theory and stuff like that. So it's like utterly impossible for me to only use primary sources. And uh, there's the, uh, plenty of gaps you still have to fill in, even just on the history side. Um, and you're not always gonna have access to everything. So, you know, it's always a mixture, of course, but some percentage of primary sources I find is always extremely helpful because you will find the things, including, yes, you will find the things that people already talk about, of course, but you will find the things that no one else has really brought up yet. So when you create your own secondary source, you are effectively um, bringing new things to light that haven't been before. Oh yeah, I would say, um, the staff has been great, absolutely great. Always willing to help and uh, um, back me up, and uh, yeah, that that was that. That kind of personal support obviously makes it work. Um, <laughs> I would say the source materials itself really make it work too, because you know where I'm based to these days on, on the East Coast. Like yeah, there are certain things I can get, and there are certain things I can't. Uh, particularly the the sheer amount of information on, say, for example, like the Cherokee papers you have here is not something that would be easy uh, to find in, in my area. So that's also a highlight. The facility itself is great. Uh, access to the uh, museum is wonderful. I love the museum. I went through it my first full day here, really quite thoroughly. I went back yesterday to look back in the. Um, the back shelves uh, have a guided tour of some of the stuff that's back there. Uh, so yeah, the whole thing really comes together quite nicely. You've got a really big collection, particularly but not obviously entirely, of Native American materials. And um, if one is here, even if one wants to see something that is not in their topic of why they're here, while you're here, you may as well do so. Like the, uh, there, some of the stuff is digitized on the website. I looked at it there and I was like, well, while I'm pulling out these things that aren't on the website, I may as well pull out anything that's particularly relevant there, see if there's anything uh, different about it. I would say that um, it's obviously always cooler to interact with the physical <laughs> thing. If I was an anthropologist, if I was an art person, um, yes, absolutely, it is very valuable to have that stuff directly in your hands.